Hey guys and gals, Effie here. Today I want to talk to you about The Last Thing to Burn by Will Dean. We'll talk about some things I like, a few things that I would have liked to have seen done differently, and of course at the end we'll discuss whether or not I think it's worth buying. In the vein of full disclosure, I did purchase this book with my own money from Amazon for about $18 US. I've not been uh, solicited or contacted by the author in any way, um, or his agents or representatives. This is all my own opinion, unsolicited. Here we go. The Last Thing to Burn is a pretty heavy book, um, not necessarily heavy uh, word-wise or, or volume-wise, but heavy content-wise. So it's about a woman who is taken by human traffickers, uh, a woman and her sister, but it's mostly about just the one character. Her name is Tan. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Please pardon me. She's Vietnamese. Uh, she was convinced with her sister to um, board themselves into a cargo container and shipped with 17 other women, not all of whom survived, into the UK. And uh, they are sold to a farm to work for a few years. And then after that, she is sold to a man who wants to use her as a domestic servant slash replacement for his deceased wife. We join her journey about seven years into her um, time with Len, who is the man who bought her. Um, and it is a harrowing tale. He he does some really awful things to her. He's, of course, very controlling. He treats her like a slave because that's what she is. Um, and it, the book has some pretty extreme depictions of uh, deprivation and abuse and all of the things that you would expect to accompany that type of situation. And I think that the author does a tremendous job of portraying her experiences in that environment. I find it difficult to describe the balance in the book because it's so well done. He does such an amazing job of portraying Tan and her inner thoughts and her desperation to retain her personhood and who she is in spite of all the terrible things that have happened to her and continue to happen to her and are going to happen to her for the foreseeable future. She has no control in her own life. She has no control over her day-to-day -day experience, over her living. She can't even choose what to wear or what food to eat. All of the things in her life are selected for her. Um, her captor has cameras set up in the house so that he can um, not only monitor her everyday existence, but make sure that she is following his rules to the letter, even when he's not right there by her side. Um, and the author does a tremendous job at making sure that we understand the reality of her situation. And of course, you're going to be wondering why if she was there for so long, didn't she simply run away? And the answer is, she did, several times. Her captor is a farmer, and they are in this very flat, reclaimed marshland sort of area, so he can see the house, meaning he can see her from anywhere on his property. Her only chances to escape are the few times a month that he actually leaves the property to go and replenish supplies. You know, he goes to the grocery store and, and gets some, um, you know, tools and farm supplies and whatnot. But uh, she tried to escape a few times and he outsmarted her. He acted like he was leaving and then waited a few minutes and then came back. And after she did that, I don't know if it was the first or second time, but he smashed her ankle with a pair of bolt cutters. And when I say smashed, I mean, he obliterated it. There's, there's no bones left. And so the entirety of the book, she's talking about this ongoing pain. Of course, it was never set. Her foot sits sideways. Um, and she's just sort of dragging behind and trying to walk on this mangled limb, this thing that he did to her. And it is a constant reminder that she is trapped and she can't escape. She can't move fast enough to get down the driveway, which is, you know, long because it's farmland. Um, she can't get to the road before he can get to her. She's tried. And every time she makes a mistake, every time she tries to escape, every time he is dissatisfied with her, he takes another piece of her away. Um, he took her 
license, he took her ID, he took her passport, her family photos, letters from her family members, all of her memories of her life and who she is as a person. He removes pieces of her personhood a little bit at a time. And the reason the book is called The Last Thing to Burn is because he burns them in the stove. They live in a tiny cottage in a, with a wood-burning stove, and he burns them in the stove. And, and he is cruel enough to make her choose which item she's going to lose. So it's not just that he is destroying her a little bit at a time. It's that he's making her participate in it. And it's really awful, but the way that it is written is so deep and so emotional and so very real. And um, yeah, I, ju I just think the author did a, a really great job. His character building for Tan, the main character, is excellent. We know who she is by um, the, the choices she makes and the sort of background mental processes that we get to be privy to as readers. Um, you know, we, we see her little defiances, even in the face of extreme deprivation, even in the face of abuse, even knowing that every time she tries, uh, he's going to take another piece of her. She still tries to escape, and that is how we enter the book, is on an escape attempt. Um, and, and she's so tremendously stalwart and so tremendously strong, and it's such a, an excellent analysis of humanity and of the steel that can reside within a person even in the face of tremendous adversity. Another way that her captor controls her is that he keeps her drugged um, because of the pain that she's in, because of the foot that he annihilated. Um, she is she needs pain medication in order to function or she'll just pass out from pain, obviously. And um, he gives her animal tranquilizers, not, not human tranquilizers, because of course he'd have to go to a doctor for that. And then people would ask questions, you know, why are you in pain? He isn't, it's for someone else. So he gives her animal pills um, of varying types. And the way that they explain it is, um, you know, sometimes it's, it's one kind of pill and sometimes it's another and it's always changing. Um, and she can't ever really tell what she's being given, only that she needs it. She's dependent on these pain medications and she knows that they're damaging her body. She can tell that they're making her teeth fall out, making her hair fall out, that they're, um, messing with her digestive system and she can't stop taking them because she can't live with the pain and she's become physically addicted to them. So it's just one more means of him controlling her, is that he uses this pain that he caused and then um, gives her the gift of alleviating it by giving her these animal tranquilizers. Um, and when she is on the drugs, the writing becomes more addled. Her mental processes that we get to see become more uh, erratic and more strange. And the author does such a good job at portraying the difference between sober Ton and drug addled Ton, and sort of her struggle to and desire to become less dependent on these pain medications, and her just sheer lack of ability to, because she just can't cope with the situation she's in without them. There are other characters in the book besides just Tan and her captor. When she's originally taken, she's taken with her sister, Kim Lee, and she has this sort of ongoing running dialogue with her imagined sister. It's a real sister, but she, she can't interact with her. She gets letters from Kim Lee that Kim is writing to her, talking about living in Manchester and working at a nail salon and all of her experiences, and Tan sort of bolsters herself and convinces herself that tolerating her existence is necessary in order to secure her sister's freedom. So Len, the captor, has convinced Tan that if she continues to behave herself and if she doesn't break any of his rules, that eventually her sister, Kim Lee, will be allowed to work off the remainder of her debt, the debt that they acquired by moving there and, and being put up and, and their living expenses and that sort of thing. And um, so it, it's interesting to watch what she forces herself to put up with 
based on the promise that her sister will have a better life. Um, and that, that relationship between them, even though we don't get to meet Kim Lee until the very end, that relationship between Tan and her sister is such a tremendous part of who she is as a person. There's also the shadow of Len's mother, who obviously had a tremendous influence on him. Her name was Jane, and she clearly ruled his household with an iron fist, and everything that he does and everything that he is is very clearly the result of this mother who's long deceased, and we don't even know how long she's been gone, but he lives in the shadow of his mother. Jane, the original Jane, was such an influence on Len that he is trying to replace her with Tan. Tan's clothing is his mother's. The bed she sleeps in is his mother's. The way that she's forced to cook is the way his mother cooked. The way that she's meant to behave is the way that his mother behaved. And all of his understanding of womanhood and personhood is tied back to this mother that we never get to see, but is such an oppressive force within the household that she feels like she's there all the time. And I thought that that was really well done, that there was this character that was clearly a part of the story, but who had been deceased for who knows how long before the story even started. Tan eventually falls pregnant after being forced into subjugation by her captor Len, um, and it changes the way that she processes the world. Everything shifts from, I have to do this in order to protect my sister, to I have to do this in order to protect my child. Tan falls in love with her daughter the moment she's laid on her chest. And it is so definitive of the way that I understand motherhood, and it's so well written. Um, and yeah, I just, I just love the way that he portrays these characters, and I love the way that he wrote this story. And despite it being such heavy content, it's still an enjoyable read. I feel like the book also does a really great job of foreshadowing Throughout the book, there are very few situations that you don't see coming. There are very few things that you don't know are going to happen before they actually happen, or that you don't know that could happen before they actually happen. And that does not detract at all from your experience reading it. In fact, I would argue that it improves it because you have the sort of cold, unmitigated dread that this thing is coming and you can't stop it. You can't save her, she can't save herself, and you just have to go with her on this horrible journey that she's on. Just because I really loved this book and I loved the way that it was written, that doesn't mean I think it was perfect, so here's a few things that I would have liked to have seen done a little differently. At one point, sort of halfway through the book, Tom describes Len as not a violent man, and I don't understand how she can see him that way. It doesn't make any sense to me. This is after he's mangled her ankle, and after his constant assault on her, and after um, the constant threat of violence, and his physical restraint of her, and I don't understand how she can see him as not violent after all the things that he has done to her. And although he doesn't beat her regularly, the threat of violence is always there. So that, that seemed like a really strange thing to include. It's not something that gets repeated, it's just something that we sort of see her thinking once, um, but that, that struck me as really odd and really discordant with the rest of the book. After the baby is born, Len tells Tan that Kim Lee was deported, and that the letters that she has been given, that he keeps giving to her, were not written over the course of seven years like she thought, but instead were all written within the first year. Um, and I think it's really strange that he chose to do that when allowing her to think that her sister was still in country was fine, like it wasn't causing any harm, and he wasn't at a point where he had to tell her yet. Um, and for some reason he chose to, and I don't really understand why. Um, we also find out that he had two more letters written by Kim Lee to Tan, and rather than use them as 
tools of manipulation, Lynn is very manipulative. And rather than use them as things to force her to behave, sort of a carrot and stick sort of situation, do what I say or I'll destroy these letters, or if you do what I say, I'll give you a portion of one of these letters, I'll give you a page, or I'll let you read a page and then you'll give it back. You know, so something like that seemed more in line with his character. And instead he burned them he, and then told her that her sister had been deported. And I don't really understand why. It seemed, um, it seemed like a strange choice. It seemed sort of out of character. And, and I'm not sure I really understand the decision making behind that process. The story has what I would call a satisfying ending. I don't want to describe it as happy because it's difficult to describe anything associated with this really heavy story um, as happy, but it, it is very satisfying. And there's a lot of closure. And I don't know that it's the ending I would have chosen, but it does seem like the right ending for the story that was told. Um, so it all sort of wraps up very neatly and everything sort of rounds out. I think I would have liked to have seen more of the long-term impact of Tan and Kimli's situations and Cynthia's situations and the things that happened to them. Um, we sort of get flash forwarded a year and uh, after everything sort of resolves and and they seem more normal than I would have expected. I don't know anybody who's actually been in a situation like this, so maybe that is how it really turns out. Maybe people do sort of get back to normal quicker than you would expect. Human beings tend to be really resilient, more resilient than we give them credit for. But it just seemed really strange to me that, you know, a year later, everybody just seems okay. And that seemed really strange to me. Overall, I found The Last Thing to Burn to be a phenomenal book. It's a great story. Um, I think it was well written. The character development was fantastic. And I cannot recommend this book enough. It is probably the best book I have read in several years. Um, I, I loved everything about it. And despite the fact that it was a heartbreaking story, it was heartbreaking in the very best way. So highly recommend, definitely worth every penny of the $18 I spent on it. And thank you, Will Dean, for writing such an amazing, amazing story. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button. And of course, if you like the way that I present information, hit the subscribe button and the notification bell down below. You can find all of my social media contacts in the description. And of course, if you want to keep up with me and the progress I'm making on my current novel, you can do that at effiewritesbooks.com. Thank you so much for watching, have an excellent day, and I'll see you next time.